Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. The Company of 100 Associates, or Company of New France, was a French trading and colonization enterprise chartered in 1627 by Chief Minister to King Louis XIII, Cardinal Richelieu, to capitalize on the North American fur trade and to expand French colonies there. The company was granted a monopoly to manage the fur trade in the colonies of New France, which were at that time centered on the St. Lawrence River Valley and the Gulf of St. Lawrence. In return, the company was supposed to settle French Catholics in New France, but were actually more interested in trade than in colonization, which was usually a drain on the company's finances. Samuel Champlain, who championed the colonization efforts, worked tirelessly to make sure the French colonies survived amid political and corporate changes of power. Let's learn more about this with the help of our friends at LibriVox. Champlain reached the Sault St. Louis on July 1, 1616. His career as an explorer had ended. The 19 years of life that still remained he gave to Quebec and the duties of his lieutenancy. By this time he had won the central position in his own domain. Question might arise as to the terms upon which a monopoly of trade should be granted, or as to the persons who should be its recipients. But whatever company might control the trade, Champlain was the king's representative in New France. When the Duc de Ventadour became viceroy, Champlain still remained lieutenant governor of New France. Such were his character, services, and knowledge that his tenure could not be questioned. Notwithstanding this source of satisfaction, the post was difficult in the extreme. The government continued to leave colonizing in the hands of the traders, and the traders continued to shirk their obligations. The company of the Duquesne did a large business, but suffered more severely than any of its predecessors from the strife of Catholic and Huguenot. It was a difficult problem for one like Champlain, who, while a loyal Catholic, had been working all his life with Huguenot associates. The period of the Duquesne's charter was marked by the presence at Quebec of Madame Champlain. The romance of Champlain's life does not, however, revolve about his marriage. In 1610, at the age of 43, he espoused Hélène Boulle, whose father was secretary of the King's Chamber to Henry IV. As the bride was only twelve years old, the marriage contract provided that she should remain two years longer with her parents. She brought a dowry of 6,000 livres, and simultaneously Champlain made his will in her favour. Subsequently, Madame Champlain became an enthusiastic Catholic and ended her days as a nun. She had no children and was only once in Canada, residing continuously at Quebec from 1620 to 1624. No mention whatever is made of her in Champlain's writings, but he named St. Helen's Island after her, and appears to have been unwilling that she should enter a convent during his lifetime. One need feel little surprise that Madame Champlain should not care to visit Canada a second time, for the buildings at Quebec had fallen into disrepair, and more than once the supply of food ran very low. During 1625, Champlain remained in France with his wife, and therefore did not witness the coming of the Jesuits to the colony. This event, which is a landmark in the history of Quebec and New France, followed upon the inability of the Récollets to cover the mission field with any degree of completeness. Conscious that their resources were unequal to the task, they invoked the aid of the Jesuits, and in this appeal were strongly supported by Champlain. Once more the horizon seemed to brighten, for the Jesuits had greater resources and influence than any other order in the Roman Catholic Church, and their establishment at Quebec meant much besides a mere increase in the population. The year 1626 saw Champlain again at his post, working hard to complete a new factory which he had left unfinished, while the buildings of the Jesuit establishment made good progress under the hand of workmen specially brought from France. What still remained imperfect was the fortification. The English had destroyed the French settlements at mont des and Port Royal. What was to hinder them from bombarding Quebec? This danger soon clouded the mood of optimism that had been inspired by the coming of the Jesuits. The Duquesne objected to any outlay on a fort, and would not give Champlain the men he needed. In reply, Champlain sent the Viceroy a report which was unfavorable to the company and its methods. But even without this representation, the monopoly of the Duquesne was doomed by reason of events which were taking place in France. At the court of Louis XIII, Richelieu had now gained an eminence and power such as never before had been possessed by a minister of the French crown. 
Gifted with imagination and covetous of national greatness, he saw the most desirable portions of other continents in the hands of the Spaniards, the Portuguese, the English, and the Dutch. The prospect was not pleasing, and he cast about for a remedy. For Hanato, Richelieu is the true founder of our colonial empire, and La Ranciere adds, Madagascar, Senegal, Guiana, the Antilles, Acadia, and Canada. This, to be exact, was the colonial empire for which we were indebted to Richelieu. Regarding his breadth of outlook, there can be no doubt, and in his memoirs he left the oft-quoted phrase, No realm is so well situated as France to be mistress of the seas, or so rich in all things needful. Desiring to strengthen maritime commerce and to hold distant possessions, he became convinced that the English and the Dutch had adopted the right policy. Strong trading companies, not weak ones, were what France needed. Henry the Fourth could have given the French a fair start, or even a lead, in the race for colonies. He missed this great opportunity, partly because he was preoccupied with the reorganization of France, and partly because Sully, his minister, had no enthusiasm for colonial ventures. Twenty years later the situation had changed. Richelieu, who was a man of wide outlook, was also compelled by the activity of England and Holland to give attention to the problem of a new France. The spirit of colonization was in the air, and Richelieu, with his genius for ideas, could not fail to see its importance or what would befall the laggards. His misfortune was that he lacked certain definite qualifications which a greater founder of colonies needed to possess. Marvelous in his grasp of diplomatic situations, and in his handling of men, he had no talent whatever for the details of commerce. His fiscal regime, particularly after France engaged in her duel with the House of Habsburg, was disorganized and intolerable. Not did he recognize that, for the French, the desire to emigrate required even greater encouragement than the commercial instinct. He compelled his company to transport settlers, but the number was not large, and he kindled no popular enthusiasm for the cause of colonization. France had once led the crusade eastward. Under proper guidance, she might easily have contributed more than she did to the exodus westward. At any rate, Richelieu, a man in the grand style if ever man was, had decided that New France should no longer languish, and the company of 100 associates was the result. In 1627, he abolished the office of Viceroy, deprived the Decanes of their charter, and prepared to make Canada a real colony. The basis of the plan was an association of 100 members, each subscribing 3,000 livres. Richelieu's own name heads the list of members, followed by those of the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Marine. Most of the members resided in Paris, though the seaboard and the eastern provinces were also represented. Nobles, wealthy merchants, small traders, all figure in the list, and twelve titles of nobility were distributed among the shareholders to help in the enlistment of capital. The company received a monopoly of trade for fifteen years, and promised to take out three hundred colonists annually during the whole period covered by the grant. It also received the St. Lawrence Valley in full ownership. One notable provision of the charter was that only Roman Catholics should be sent to New France, and the company was placed under special obligation to maintain three priests in every settlement until the colony could support its own clergy. Champlain was now sixty years of age, and he had suffered much. Suddenly there burst forth the spontaneous enthusiasm of Richelieu, the all-powerful. Was Champlain's dream of the great city of Ludovica to come true after all? Alas, like previous visions, it faded before the glare of harsh, uncompromising facts. The year in which Richelieu founded his company of New France was also the year of a fierce Huguenot revolt. Calling on England for aid, La Rochelle defied Paris, the king, and the cardinal. Richelieu laid siege to the place. Guiton, the mayor, sat at his council board with a bare dagger before him to warn the faint-hearted. The old Duchesse de Rouen starved with the populace. Salbert, the most eloquent of Huguenot pastors, preached that martyrdom was better than surrender. Meanwhile, Richelieu built his mole across the harbor, and Buckingham wasted the English troops to which the citizens looked for their salvation. Then the town yielded. The fall of La Rochelle was a great personal triumph for Richelieu, but the war with England brought disaster to the company of New France. At Dieppe there had lived for many years an Englishman named Jarvis, or Gervais, Kirk who with his five sons, David, Louis, Thomas, John, and James, knew much at first hand about the French merchant marine. Early in the spring of 1628, Kirk, who had shortly before moved to London, secured letters of Mark and sent forth his sons to do what damage they could to the French in the St. Lawrence. Champlain had spent the winter at Quebec and was, of course, expecting his usual supplies with the opening of navigation. Instead came Louis Kirk, sent from Tadoussac by his brother David, to demand surrender. 
check out the YouTube version of this episode, which has accompanying images. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride. Thank you.